Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Terry, and I'm the president and CEO for the Columbus Council on World Affairs. Thank, thank you all for being here. Um, we ordered up some sunshine, so by the end of the program, it'll be 62 and sunny. Uh, that's, that's the plan. And uh, let's get started with today's program. I want to remind you that uh, during the program, we encourage you to start writing questions. There's note cards on the tables. Uh, and then at the end, when, uh, when our distinguished speaker finishes, uh, I'll come up and moderate some Q&A, and we'll invite you to submit those, uh, those note cards with questions at that time. Of course, you can tweet uh, if you'd like to do that, um, if you so choose. And the, the hashtag is on your, um, on your um, uh, or the, the handle is on your um, table tent. Thank you. All right, let's turn to today's topic. As trade negotiations continue with the U.S. and China, one of the most significant topics of discussion is the technology issue, the relationship between the two superpowers. Growing Chinese tech dominance has Washington concerned over China's influence over intellectual property and security. The U.S. government points to China's national intelligence law that mandates Chinese companies to, quote, support, cooperate, and collaborate in national work national intelligence work. And that's as ev evidence of the dangers of China's involvement in the cyber world and the th threat to the US. So these close ties between Chinese tech companies and the Chinese government poses potential security risks for US firms because everyday life is all online now. Autonomous vehicles, your appliances, everything. So today, we're gonna to take a closer look at some of these security issues, what it means to us in the US and here in Ohio. And we have someone very special to talk with us about this topic. Dr. Adam Siegel is the Ira Lippmann Chair in Emerging Technologies and National Security, as well as the Director of the Digital and Cyberspace Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Siegel brings a wealth of experience and knowledge around cybersecurity and relations with China in particular. Prior to his work at CFR, he was an arms control analyst for the China Project with the Union of Concerned Scientists. And he's authored several books and articles around the new cyber age and China's role in the technology enterprises. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Siegel. Uh, thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you all for coming out uh, today and to the uh, World Affairs Council for, uh, for bringing me uh, out here to speak to you today. What I'm gonna do, uh, and hopefully no more than 20 minutes, so we have plenty of time for, for Q&A, uh, is basically argue that the most dramatic competition right now uh, between the United States and China is on the technology front. And that competition goes from everything to who designs the technology, to the chips that we use in all of our devices, to how you should act in cyberspace, you know, what type of attack should be allowed, uh, what type of data should be collected, to who governs cyberspace, what rules should decide how states, uh, nations, and individuals uh, behave. And it's a competition that, as I said, goes all the way from the chip to these broad ideas of governance. And I think in some ways, it is m the most important competition that we are in with China right now. What I'm gonna do is talk about why it matters to the US and China, uh, talk a little bit about what's happened so far, how the two sides have reacted to each other, uh, and then I'll finish with some kind of speculation about what's gonna happen in the immediate future. Why it matters so much, right? On the digital side, cyberspace hits three primary concerns for China. The first one, which is uh, the one we're probably most familiar with, is that the Chinese are worried about how the internet might uh, empower opposition, domestic opposition, right? The free flow of ideas into China that people will use to protest against the Chinese Communist Party, organize protests, um, and so they have built a very vibrant, uh, technologically advanced system for keeping information out, right, known as the Great Firewall of China. 
Um, and this the Chinese have gotten very good at keeping that technology out um, and keeping certain things, images, ideas offline in China. Uh, when President Xi and President Obama met each other in September of 2000, and, uh, uh, excuse me, in June of 2015 at Sunnylands, uh, they went for a walk together in the afternoon. Uh, you may remember, you know, President Obama was rather lean. President Xi is slightly portly. Um, and some Chinese citizen decided that that photo looked a little bit like Tigger and Winnie the Pooh walking around. <laughs> And so that became a meme that circulated in China, Tigger and Winnie the Pooh. And the Communist Party decided that that was uh, too dangerous. And so if you sent someone a text in China saying, isn't this a funny picture, the Chinese technology became sophisticated enough that they could strip off the image of Winnie the Pooh, but the text would still go through. Um, so they were really reaching into people's personal communications to block that information. So prevent the information from coming in. Also, the Chinese are worried uh, long term that they're going to be dependent on the West for technology. Right? We think about China as factory to the world, but the Chinese don't want to be the factory to the world forever. They want to move up the value chain. Right? There are economic reasons. You don't want to constantly uh, have most of the value be uh, with the people that own intellectual property rights. Right? If you manufacture and put together the iPhone, most of the value goes to the patent holders, not to the people who are putting the, the, the phone together. So the Chinese want to move up the value chain, and they see the digital space as being an area where they should be able to compete uh, with the United States uh, and with the West. And then finally, the Chinese are worried about security. They're worried about cyber attacks uh, on their networks, about the United States stealing data from them, uh, and what the United States might do to China through uh, a cyber attack. We hear a lot about the Chinese attacking the US. We don't hear very much about the US attacking China, but I have to assume, and I want the US military to be doing somewhat similar things to China uh, on their networks, and the Chinese are worried about that. right? How do you keep uh, po possible attackers out of that space? So those are the three concerns on the Chinese side. On the US side, we have similar concerns. We're very worried about the cybersecurity threat. right? So, uh, General Alexander, who would, had been the former director of the NSA and, and Cyber Command, once described the theft of intellectual property from U.S. companies as the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. Um, or as another uh, cybersecurity uh, expert put it, there are two kinds of companies, those who've been hacked and those who don't know it yet. Right? So we know that the Chinese engage in a widespread campaign of industrial property theft. Uh, much of it was directed at the technologies that the Chinese wanted to move up the value chain in, right? So if you were in autonomous cars or uh, artificial intelligence, uh, certain areas in biotech, you were very likely to be targeted, and you were very likely to probably have been uh, penetrated and your information stolen. So the U.S. wants to stop that, uh, and we're worried about other broader security risks. And for the first time, we are really, truly worried about com competition from China on the tech side. Right? It used to be that we thought of China as a place that everything was copied. Right? But we are beginning to see that China is, in fact, succeeding in moving up the value chain. And partly the reason that they're doing that is they're spending, uh, they've increased the spending on their research and development by double digits for 20 years. Right? So China now spends about, depending upon how you measure it, uh, $285 billion a year on uh, R&D. The U.S. still spend, spends more, but China is now number two, and China will soon pass the United States, especially since we don't spend that much any longer. We used to spend 2% of GDP on R&D. We now spend less than 0.7%. So the Chinese are going to pass us eventually uh, on how much they spend. Uh, Eight million university graduates a year, about 1.5 million of them in the, in the STEM, right? Science, technology, uh, uh, engineering, and mathematics. Chinese scientific publications have gone up, citations have gone up, so China is clearly moving uh, up, up the value chain. And so for the first time, we're really worried about competition, in particular sectors like artificial intelligence, uh, quantum, and, and 5G, the fifth generation of telecommunications. So what have we done, right? What, what have the responses been? On the Chinese side, uh, President Xi has consolidated power over cybersecurity like he has in many other areas, right? So one of the defining characteristics of uh, the Xi uh, regime has been the creation of these commissions or small groups 
for topics that are of high importance. And before, cybersecurity existed spread around many, many different agencies in China. The Ministry of Public Security, the Ministry of State Security, the Ministry of Information Technology, the People's Liberation Army, uh, and it was fairly backlogged, right? They, they had the same kind of bureaucratic problems that we would have in the United States, uh, silo, different types of uh, bureaucratic battles. And so President Xi, by signaling from the top, said, we're gonna create a small leadership group, we're gonna create uh, kind of a new energy behind this, and he became head of that group. And he declared that without cybersecurity, there is no national security, which has become kind of a standard phrase that the Chinese use now to push, push forward. They passed a, a, a range of new laws, uh, an anti-terrorism law, a national security law, and a national cybersecurity law, which uh, has caused a great deal of concern among uh, US companies because that national cybersecurity law says if you're involved in certain uh, sectors, and we're gonna define that, those sectors extremely broadly, there are lots of things you have to do if you wanna be put into you, uh, Chinese infrastructure. You might have to show us the, 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 the code. You might have to let us do equipment reviews, right? Which allows them perhaps to steal that intellectual property. You're gonna have to store the data locally, right? Uh, if you're involved in, in certain areas. And so US companies have uh, pushed back against uh, that space. And then also the Chinese have used uh, technology and uh, cyber diplomacy as part of what's known as the Belt and Road Initiative. Right? The Belt and Road Initiative um, involves building infrastructure that connects China to Eurasia and Africa. Um, about, we're not really sure the total number, but about one trillion uh, for ports, uh, railroads, uh, highways, but it also includes a digital component, right? So um, uh, telecom, satellites, uh, e-commerce e e platforms, and the Chinese will be able to both have access to that data and perhaps also uh, for both business and for uh, espionage reasons. So a pretty aggressive uh, set of policies to make sure that China can be a cyber power as they uh, move forward. On the U.S. side, the Trump administration has identified this kind of tech competition as, as kind of central to how we think about uh, China. And, and they've pursued a several uh, set of policies. The, the, the first one, of course, is the trade war. Um, and, you know, it, of course, in uh, Ohio, there's a lot of focus on the manufacturing and, and the soybean side, but there is a tech component too, right? Uh, a lot of the tariffs were placed on components that uh, were being sold uh, into, the, into the U.S. Um, and the goal might here be to uh, eventually kind of move supply chains, right? Raise the costs so tech uh, companies have to reshift their supply chains uh, around. We've also tried to think about how is technology flowing out of the United States to China? And one of the things that has happened through Congress and the Trump administration is a revision of the rules that uh, um, guide foreign investment in the United States. So uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, the CFIUS process, uh, deals with any investment that might have a national security implication. A bill called FIRMA was passed that expanded the aperture, so we look at more types of deals. Uh, and we've seen a couple that have been blocked because of the, the worry about national security risk to China. Uh, Broadcom and Qualcomm, uh, and Financial and uh, Western Union. Uh, and so that is uh, beginning to have an effect on where the Chinese think they should invest their money, uh, and especially in, in Silicon Valley and, and high tech sectors. There's also now a, a discussion about uh, expanding the types of technology under export controls, right? So what can you sell to the Chinese? Um, or if you're a university, what type of technologies can Chinese students uh, uh, come into contact with under what are called deemed exports, right? And again, those, that list is gonna be broadened uh, we don't know how uh, wide, but right now the, the Trump administration is talking about what they call emerging foundational technologies, but it is focused uh, in artificial intelligence, quantum, and some other spaces. The tech sector is very worried it's gonna be too broad, right? Because it's very hard to distinguish between a dual use uh, and a military use for most of these technologies, especially AI, right? If I have a self-driving car, that technology is gonna be the same as for a self-driving tank. Right? And how would you make sure that you don't punish U.S. companies, not allow them to sell it abroad, because uh, if we don't sell it, the Israelis or the Europeans or somebody else is gonna step into that space. And then finally, there's been some discussion about uh, visa restrictions on Chinese students. Right? How do we make sure 
um, that there's a small number of those Chinese students have been involved in intellectual property theft. How do we ensure that we both keep the openness of the US um, academic environment, which has been our great strength, but uh, address these intelligence uh, concerns? We've begun to try to go after the hackers. So there was a agreement between President Xi and President Obama where the Chinese said, all right, we're not gonna hack any longer, right? The US tried to convince the Chinese that there's good hacking and there's bad hacking, right? And you won't be surprised that the good hacking is what the US is good at and the, and the bad hacking is what the Chinese are good at. And we said, look, Everyone's gonna spy on each other, right? That's what states do, we're not gonna control that. But stealing intellectual property, that, that's different. And we put a lot of pressure on the Chinese, we named and shamed them, we called out some PLA hackers, we indicted some PLA hackers from the People's Liberation Army. The Chinese signed this agreement, and then there was a year where the hacking downturn, there was a drop off on the downturn. Now, now it's back. Right, it's started to come back up, and the Trump administration has started uh, with our allies indicting another set of hackers and trying to raise the cost uh, uh, to them. Uh, and uh, the Defense Department now has a more aggressive strategy in cyberspace. We used to talk about deterrence, right, trying to prevent someone to attack before they did, so they know that the cost is too high. Now we're talking about forward defense, which means stopping them before they ever get to the networks. Let me uh, end with where I think this might go and then end with a very big question that I don't have the answer to. So on the where this is going, the, the most worrying part about it is, is that we're not really talking about the tech issues, right, between the two sides. We're talking a lot about the trade issues and there are some tech issues involved and the Chinese uh, in the early kind of leaks we have about where the trade negotiations are doing. For example, passed a law that said we're not gonna force uh, technology transfer from companies any longer, we're gonna protect IP. But on the big issues about how do we govern AI, right, which is a transnational issue, we're, we're not discussing these things. How do we think about cyber attacks, right? Is there good hacking and bad hacking? None of this is, is happening because we're so focused uh, on, the, on the trade war, and I hope that soon we will begin um, thinking about uh, where we're gonna go with that. The hacking is gonna continue. So if you have a company in one of these sectors that the Chinese are moving up in, you should be worried, and you should be thinking about what to do on the defense side. The Trump administration, I think, uh, is gonna feel increasing pressure to do something more than just indicting hackers, right? Because when you indict somebody in the People's Liberation Army, it's embarrassing, but those people are never gonna see the inside of a US court unless they do something stupid, like traveling to Thailand or the Czech Republic or someplace where the US has an extradition treaty, and they're not stupid people. So the next thing the Trump administration could do was, would be to sanction a Chinese company that benefits from the tech theft, right? So we know that the hackers tend to work with state-owned enterprises, so they could then go after them then the possibility would be that the Chinese would retaliate against US companies. Right? So we could get in a tit for tat situation. We're beginning to see some shifting of supply chains. Right? So US companies in a survey um, uh, about six months ago, about 80% or 90% of them that, that had business in China said yes, we are gonna move uh, part of our supply chain or, or reproduce part of our supply chain uh, that's now in China. But of course, they're not bringing it back to the states, they're gonna to go to Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, or Indonesia. Right? So those supply chains are gonna move. And we see Chinese companies, uh, Huawei, the, the 5G company, also because it's worried about pressure from the United States, telling their suppliers, you need to move into China. Right? So we're seeing some uh, movement on the supply chain. And then uh, we're beginning to see some shift in, in foreign investment. Right? So when the Chinese were told, we're gonna to, um, pay more attention to your investments in technology, they, they said, all right, we're gonna you know, reduce in investments pretty massively from the last year to this year, and we'll start looking uh, in Europe, uh, Israel, and, and other places. Um, the Europeans and Israelis are probably gonna pass similar laws uh, on, uh, on foreign investment. They've all been talking about it. The, the EU in particular is supposed to rule out one, and been putting, the US has been putting a lot of pressure on Israel um, to do this. So the Chinese are gonna find it more difficult uh, as, they, uh, as they move forward. I'll end with the, my big question that I do not have an answer for, which is um, how do we think about uh, the science, what we, right now has been a globalized science and technology system. 
right? Especially um, being here uh, in Columbus and, and having Ohio State here, we know that science is extremely global, right? Students go back and forth, professors work with their colleagues abroad, companies have uh, R&D labs in, in other places, and this has benefited the United States and China immensely. But if the goal is to, in some ways, decouple the two, what does that look like? Do we live in a world where we have two different technology platforms, right? Do we have a world where, you know, for the most part, most of you are probably not visiting the Chinese internet, right? It's in Chinese, right? And we're not using Chinese services, but for every US service we use, there is a Chinese service, right? So WeChat and WhatsApp, uh, Tencent, Alibaba, and these are massive companies that are expanding uh, into third, part, third markets, right? So the question isn't necessarily so much the US and China, but it has to do about what's gonna happen in India, right? India now, the top 10 um, sites are foreign. They tend to be American, but they quickly could become uh, Chinese. The only one that probably, if you have kids, your kids are probably using, they might be using TikTok, um, which is a Chinese company. Uh, so you have to worry about what the data is happening to the data and it's where it's going. But for the most part, we can imagine a world where people are using different platforms and we have a kind of separate uh, S&T system uh, increasingly uh, bifurcated. What that means for U.S. innovation and Chinese innovation is kind of my, I don't, I don't know, right? I, I, I believe that the, the reason the U.S. has been so innovative the last 50 years is in, in, in large part because we were so globalized. Right? We managed to take advantage that the best and the brightest wanted to come here, they wanted to stay, uh, and we had a sharing of ideas. Right? We were an important node with our European allies uh, and Japanese and others in this flow of uh, ideas. I, f I fear that in this next wave, this next battle, we lose more than the Chinese do. Right? The Chinese have a top-down system in place. They can spend loads more than we're willing to spend uh, on science and technology. So in the long term, I'm worried that while I uh, think a lot of this uh, competition should engage, that we want to make sure that we don't uh, shoot ourselves in the foot. I'll stop there. Thank, thank you so much, Adam. And please, uh, you can write your questions. We have one here. Um, just kind of wave your hand and uh, um, some of my colleagues will bring the questions up, up to the table. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask, ask the first one um, and, and kind of get us kicked off. I was thinking um, about your talk and you focus on um, mostly, it sounds like corporate and um, I mean, the threat being to corporations and, and US companies. Um, you know, we also hear a lot about cyber hacking and meddling in elections, um, not so much from the Chinese, but from, the, from, from Russia. As we near 2020's elections, um, can you comment on whether you think, what role you think China might have in this? Should we be worried about China in terms of our, our political system as well as our economic system? Yeah, uh, so I, I think it's very unlikely that the Chinese uh, interfere in, in that way through the, what we know what the Russians did, right? The Russians did, um, uh, so they attacked the DNC and John Podesta, right, and then released their emails through WikiLeaks and uh, DC Leaks and others. Uh, we know that they scanned the election infrastructure, right, so they kind of uh, knew if they wanted to hack the actual voting, that how they might go about it, do it, although they did not do it, they just kind of uh, looked out there. And, you know, uh, engaged on um, social media with, um, you know, disinformation, and basically just trying to make Americans even more mad at each other than we already are, right? So through accounts that tweeted, uh, you know, discussions we already have in the US, but more extreme, trying to engage them. So the, we haven't seen any evidence the Chinese have engaged in any of this. They, they do do similar things, but only on things that they consider internal issues. So Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, uh, if you're a Tibetan activist or if you're a Uyghur activist, you would probably be susceptible to those things. I, don't, I think it's very unlikely that they'll do it in the United States. One is they have other tools of influence, right? You know, they, there's just so much more Chinese investment in the United States. Uh, Confucius Institutes, 
uh, other ways of, of doing it, and I just think they don't, right now, they don't see the, the, the benefit on the social media side. I think the other reason is that the, the, the Russians have much more of a uh, strategy, which is it's good for them where people just can't really tell the truth between what's, you know, what's online, right? What's disinformation, what's, what's real, and the Russians actually don't mind that, right? It serves their interests. They have a much more, let's just kind of throw sand in the machine view. I don't think the Chinese want to live in that world. They don't want to live in a world because they believe that, you know, one, they have a story, to, a good story to tell their populace, that the Communist Party has done what it says it's going to do about making China uh, a stronger place. And the Chinese don't want to burn all in international institutions down. They just want those institutions to reflect their interests uh, more strongly. Uh, so I, th I think it's unlikely. It's good to hear. Was that good? things to worry about. Don't worry about it. Was yeah. that good news? <laughs> In today's world, that, that sounds like good news. Um, you talked about Huawei, and um, it, that was in the news for a long time in, yeah. in the U.S., and it's somewhat of a complicated thing. Can you just help us understand that situation better and where it stands now? Yeah, sure. So um, that's been one of the things that the Trump administration has tried very hard to do, which is convince uh, friends, allies, others, not to use Huawei uh, in the build out of 5G, right? So we're moving towards a new generation of telecom. This, this new generation is going to be uh, much, much faster, hundreds of times faster. Uh, and it is going to allow, when people talk about self-driving cars, you, you can't have self-driving cars without 5G, right? Because the cars are going to constantly need to communicate with each other and download data and, and everything else. So, all of these things we're, we're hoping to build in the future is, is going to require 5G. And we want to make sure that that system is secure and hopefully has U.S. patents and standards and other things in it. So the U.S. has essentially argued that uh, you shouldn't trust uh, Huawei, right? Because it's a Chinese company. Um, the founder of Huawei, uh, Ren Zhengfei, was an engineer in the People's Liberation Army, but I, I don't, you know, not a huge deal, quite honestly, because if you look at, you know, how many U.S. companies do we have, we have that people also served in the military. The U.S. has no evidence and never provided any evidence that there are any vulnerabilities or back doors in Huawei product, right? We've never been able to say, look, here is a product that we know that, P uh, that Huawei weakened on purpose, and we have no evidence that, in fact, Huawei ever turned over data to the Chinese government, right? What, what the US government has done is basically make a two-part argument. One part is that 5G is gonna be different than 4G and 3G, and how you defend against, secure them. In 5G, you, there's very little difference between the core and the periphery, right? Between the, you know, the base station and the entire network, because there's so much data moving back and forth, and the equipment manufacturer is constantly updating the software. They're always pushing software. So even if I know version 2.0 is safe, that might be updated a week later, and version 3.0 is not going to be safe. Right? So 5G is very, very difficult to uh, defend against. And the other part is you just can't trust Huawei. Right? You can't trust Chinese companies, in part because, as Patrick mentioned in his introductory comments, the Chinese passed this law, which I don't think they knew was going to have this reverberations, the national intelligence law that in some reading seems to suggest that Chinese companies should engage in espionage. Now, I, there are plenty of lawyers who say that that's not how it should be read. It's read in different ways. It's more like a see something, say something kind of way that if the, you know, Huawei has a responsibility to do that thing. I, that doesn't re reassure me very much. Chinese law doesn't really reassure me very much, right? Because the, if the party shows up, and says to the Huawei, turn over the data, Huawei really does not have a lot of solutions. Right? Huawei has constantly in the last couple of weeks said, we don't have to do it, we won't do it. I, I wouldn't believe that. Right? But the, the fact is, is that all telecom companies cooperate with their intelligence agencies. Right? That, that's what telecom companies do. And so the argument then has to be how comfortable you are with you know, the, the rules and regulations in liberal democracies that are more transparent and those in authoritarian states that are not transparent at all. U.S. tried to convince our allies and friends not to do it, and this week basically they said, we're not listening. Right? We know there's a risk, but uh, we already have Huawei equipment uh, in our um, 
uh, infrastructure. And look, there are only five suppliers of this equipment right now. Huawei, ZTE, another Chinese company, Nokia, Ericsson, and Samsung. Right? So no, no US companies. And Huawei is a third cheaper. Right? So you're expecting us to rip this other stuff out. Who's going to pay for it? Right? So we realize there's a risk, but we think we can manage it in other ways. And I think that has really been the argument that developing countries are going to accept. Right? If, um, if I am you know, in Ghana, and I, my big goal is uh, access, right? I want my population to have access to these technologies. I'm going to think, look, I'm going to get spied on anyway. Right? It's either going to be the US or the Chinese or both. So do I really care that much? No, I'm going to go with the product that's cheaper. And the, and the Chinese are going to help fund it. Uh, and so unfortunately, the, the, Obama, uh, excuse me, the Trump administration had a kind of argument that said, don't do it, but didn't really have a follow-up that says, if you're not going to do it, this is what we can provide uh, in its place. So one of the questions was, will the US launched global resistance against Huawei be successful? No. Sounds like no. <laughs> okay. I don't think so. So I, I think that this trend, I mean, in part because you know, when the UK, you know, our closest intelligence uh, partners, basically says, we, there, look, we realize there's a risk, but there are lots of risks, right? That's risk management. And we can manage the risk by keeping Huawei far away from critical networks, by inspecting Huawei every day if we have to. Um, we're we're going to do it. So then it gives everybody else a, uh, a justification to say, well, if the Brits aren't going to keep it out, then um, we're not going to do it either. The, the Secretary Pompeo and others have threatened to withhold intelligence sharing with p countries that build out Huawei. I, I suspect that that will not go very far because that's going to be totally, that will definitely be a, a self-inflicted wound because these countries are, you know, are tracking jihadis and others in their own country. And you know, we're going to say, all right, we're totally done. I mean, yes, we provide you know, a, a huge amount of important intelligence to them, but it is a two-way street. And nobody wants to be responsible for you know, somebody, a, a Brit who had spent the last two years working for ISIS who, who goes underneath the radar because we're not sharing information any longer. Uh, last question on Huawei, at least for, for now. Um, th this question is, as an expat in the Middle East, uh, the country where I live contracted with Huawei for its mobile network development. And three months after the agreement, there was a tech blackout as government anti-hackers triggered uh, shut down networks. Many thought it was Huawei attempting espionage. Is this a common occurrence? Uh, so I've never heard, I, I'd like to know what that case is. Um, I've never heard of that case. Um, so I, I have not heard of very many instances of uh, hackers inside a country uh, posing Huawei and then trying to shut down uh, the system. The thing about you know, the hacking world and the digital world is we rarely know people claim responsibility if they actually did it, right? Every time a power grid gets hacked or, or every time a power grid goes out, right, there is a story that, oh, it's been hacked. The vast majority of times that a power grid goes out, it's a squirrel, <laughs> right? And the, a squirrel chews into is something. That, is that code for a No, hacker? no, it's a, it's a literal, it's a literal squirrel. <laughs> In fact, there is a very funny Twitter handle called Cyber Squirrel that follows how many squirrels have taken out power grids. So in this case, I just, I just don't know um, if it was taken out. Um, but we haven't seen a lot of opposition domestically to, to Huawei building out. Got it. Thank you. Let's uh, move to another topic. Uh, what tech areas, if any, can China surpass the US militarily in? for the future. Yeah. So the, I would say right now there are, there are two places that people are, are most worried with. The, the first one, as I mentioned already, is, is artificial intelligence. Right? So artificial intelligence, very, very broadly, is you know, any system that would recreate kind of human thinking. Um, but uh, basically right now it's pattern recognition, um, machine learning used for, um, and they're going to clearly be military uses. You know, I mentioned uh, uh, you know, we're using them already in uh, autonomous vehicles, and robotics, um, but a lot of the uses are going to be kind of logistics, other, other things like that. So there are some who believe that uh, China is winning and will win the AI race, right? There is a, a book that came out this year called, I think, The AI Race, 
by Kai-Fu Li, who was a very famous Chinese technologist. He had worked at uh, Google, he worked at Microsoft, he now invests in Chinese companies. And his argument is basically the age of kind of innovation with AI is over and we're now in the age of implementation. Right? We have the basic systems and the countries that implement faster are the ones that are gonna win in, in AI. And here China has a massive advantage which is just huge amounts of data, right? 730 million Chinese net users, right? And that data is, the companies can agglomerate it together. They can work across different uh, bases, right? So both, you know, internet use data, health data, other things all together. Um, and so uh, a regulatory environment that is pushing the, the companies, uh, a lot of money being spent. We don't know exactly how much, but for example, um, you know, I'm gonna say a small city in China, but it's, you know, eight million people. Um, they're investing between eight, uh, between one and two billion dollars. So that's just one locality uh, in AI. They wanna have a market of 150 billion. Um, and, a, and a, you know, and local governments that wanna help. So a, a friend was telling me that, you know, they, he, a Chinese uh, entrepreneur, he's involved in a, um, a AI company with auto driving cars. They were having a problem because one of their bases kept getting blocked by a tree, you know, it was in the way. So they called, you know, the local government, they chopped the tree down 20 minutes later. You're not gonna chop the tree down in New York right now, right? I mean, if we did, you'd have to have six weeks of meetings. You know, we would talk about, you know, can the tree come down, can the tree cannot come down? Somebody would chain themselves to the tree. Uh, so a regulatory environment that allows the Chinese to, to move ahead. That is uh, one view about AI that, is not necessarily all that widely accepted. Many people don't think the age of innovation of AI is over, right? There's gonna be some massive breakthroughs coming through, and, it, and big data is important, but uh, small data, lots of companies in the US are training very, very interesting systems on small data. So the US could move forward there. The big weakness that China has uh, is chips and talent, right? So China doesn't have uh, the, the, the computational power that the U.S. does, they, they want to have it, they're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on it, and the talent is still mainly located uh, in the U.S. It, it flows back and forth, of course, but it's mainly U.S. Um, and, uh, and so if you put those two together, the U.S. is pretty strongly uh, positioned there. The other is in quantum. Uh, here the Chinese have exceeded us in quantum communication, so there's a satellite that's been used for quantum communication. The problem, with the, the problem that the Chinese solved through quantum is a problem we already know how to solve, so it's not necessarily uh, a leap ahead. Uh, so that's quantum communication. Quantum computing uh, is a bigger deal, and here we don't really know, of course, because a lot of it is black budget, so done in the intelligence agencies, but commercially the US would be ahead. What's quantum So computing? quantum computing is, um, right, our, our, our computing now operates on, you know, uh, um, a one and a zero, right? Digital uh, one or a zero. Quantum computing allows you to have a one or a zero or both at the same time, all at the same time. And it would provide you to do quadrillions of calculations at the same time, um, much, much faster than we could already get at exascale rates, which is in the quadrillion. So it would allow you to model and break through, you, it would break all encryption, or most encryption that we have now. Um, and it allows you to model you know, incredibly complicated interactions in, in biology, health, nuclear weapons, and so, uh, and quantum computing uh, operates on what's called spooky entanglement, and now we're really getting to the edge of my quantum knowledge, but what happens with, with these ones and zeros and qubits together is that they're connected in a, in a spooky way, and if you touch one of them, the other one also is touched. So you would know that somebody hacked into your communication uh, at the other end because you would see the, see the change there. Of course, it could be a squirrel that happened. Could be a squirrel. That could, that could when be in a, doubt, I always say squirrel. Squirrel. Um, are there any international cyber regulatory agencies? Hmm. There are, um, so it depends what we mean by cyber, right? Um, but the general answer is no, right? So the internet you know, started as a US invention, started as the ARPANET, and then the next thing you know, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a global platform, right? It was created for scientists to share information. Uh, those 20 scientists all knew each other, so they didn't really think about security, right? They were just worried about how fast they can get on the line of the mainframes. Then we have this global platform, we realize, 
you know, holy cow, we have no security in this thing. What are we, we, what are we going to do? There are some what are called multi-stakeholder models of governance. So involves technicians and the companies and some government. So one of them is called ICANN, the Internet Corporation of Assigned Networks and Names. The other one is called uh, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. They meet to discuss some issues of uh, standards and how the government should regulate. But on a global level, like, you know, is this type of cyber attack legal or not? It doesn't exist now. The, the U.S. has tried to argue, and we've um, been arguing that we believe that, look, yes, yeah, cyber is new and confusing, but international law should apply. Right? We already have a long history of regulating war, and we'll just apply those things to cyberspace. It's going to be complicated, right? What neutrality means in cyberspace, does that mean that I can't route my attack through Germany if, the, you know, if Germany's not involved in that war or proportionality and distinction, but we think we can kind of come to those solutions. The Chinese and the Russians have said, yeah, we don't think so. We think we need a whole new treaty to control cyber weapons. And the two sides really have not, we had a brief period where there was some um, overlap. So there was a group at the UN called the Group of Government Experts. They released a couple of reports that said, we can agree on some common, very basic rules. But that group, unfortunately, has fallen apart. OK. A few times you mentioned um, or satellites. And I'm wondering, to what extent does space play a role in this conversation? I mean, I know we're going to have our own space force uh, eventually, but um, but seriously, what does what, so, what does it mean to be? Uh, I mean, they're they're very tightly connected, right? Because so much of the stuff is going up and down through satellites. The Chinese, when they think about military use of a military cyber attack, it involves taking out U.S. space, space assets, right? The Chinese, uh, when they write about a war with a you know technologically superior. Uh, adversary from coming somewhere from the Western Pacific, what they talk about is in that first stage, we want to seize information dominance, right? Because they looked at how the U.S. has fought our last, you know, uh, three wars, which is by knocking out the other side's command and control systems, right? How they see, how they communicate, everything else. And so the Chinese said, yeah, that, that seems to work. We're going to do the exact same thing. So a cyber attack would be uh, involved with blinding U.S. space assets uh, as well. You know, we've had longer, um, the difference with the space side is that we've had longer to think about it and talk about it. There are fewer space powers, right? So it's still hard, right? India just blew up a satellite. Um, it's going to create, all, I'm sure it created a huge amount of debris. We don't really have great regulations on that stuff. But cyber, everybody gets to play, right? Um, you don't have to launch anything. You can buy it off the shelf, right? You can go decide, oh, I want to have a cyber command. Uh, you, a lot of them are Israeli companies or others, and you buy the, 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 um, the, 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 the capabilities, then you start attacking your neighbors. Let's move into the area. We're getting to the good news, right? <laughs> yeah. The area of talent. Um, these two questions, I think, have to do with uh, that topic. Can you provide insight into the 1,000 Talents program and how it is believed to be uh, nation state sponsor and how companies may consider this an insider threat. And explain what is yeah. 1,000 Talent. So the, the 1,000 Talent program is a, was in an effort by uh, China to basically start having the drain brain, brain drain come back, right? So China has been sending you know, its best scientific minds uh, and, and engineering and other talent to the United States and Australia and UK for the last 30 plus years. And, and um, you know, what, I think when, the, when you know, Deng Xiaoping and others first promoted that policy, their understanding was that they would come back, right, and contribute uh, to, to growth uh, in China. And the, the 1,000 the 1, Talent Program is a, an attempt to identify Chinese talent uh, in, in the United States and other places um, and say, look, come back. Here's a lab. We have all of this money we can spend. We can pay for all of your graduate students. Um, we'll help you set up another company if you'd like. Uh, you can get rent free for three weeks, uh, three years, or five years, or whatever the, the terms are now. Um, and in some sectors, especially uh, in, the, in biotech, 
um, you know, after there was a drop off in NIH funding, it was very attractive for Chinese uh, scientists to go back because there was just a huge amount of money coming and uh, the lab equipment was, you know, much newer and, every, and everything else. So uh, a lot of that, uh, I would say, you know, look, that, that's what's going to happen and, and, and it makes sense the Chinese wanted, would want to do that. There have been cases um, that Chinese have uh, either, you know, in, in the, either worked for the U.S. government, so NSF and others have basically said, you have to tell us if you're doing this, right? Because some Chinese scientists were basically like double dipping, accepting from the U.S. government uh, and the Chinese government and going back and forth. And so finally, the NSF and others said, you can't do that. You, you, you know, choose one or the other, which makes sense to me. And some people were stealing the information uh, from their home uh, um, sources and uh, going back to China and then saying, I'm, I'm back, I'm a China, you know, 1,000 talent, and, and they took the money and, and funded there. So uh, uh, clearly there is an insider threat. Um, and I, you know, just to echo my earlier point, I, I think it needs to be legitimately uh, addressed. I hope we do it in a way that gets the balance right, right? I, I still want to make sure that um, we don't, you know, uh, in, you know, there have been some cases where the FBI went after people that were not um, involved in any international property theft. Um, and so we have to have, I think, better training both, you know, places like uh, Ohio State and, uh, you know, Stanford, they have a huge infrastructure in place to deal with uh, technology controls and others. Other universities are not going to be as good. And so we probably need to think about how we make sure that we can scale there. Uh, and other companies, you know, need to be aware of the problem. But I, I, um, it's not one that, again, you want to say, oh, you're, you know, we're not going to hire Chinese scientists because you know, the 1,000 talent people are going to show up next week. Can you help us get a sense for the, tr the trade war with China and what, how that impacts um, the technology conversation? Yeah, so uh, you know, I'm I, I'm, I'm as, in as blue uh, in as dark about the trade war as, as everybody else is, just dealing with whatever leaks or tweets or whatever else we're 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 coming from. My my sense is is that we we will have a deal. Um, it, it I don't think it'll be a particularly good deal, right? It, it will include you know purchases of of soybeans, and there were rumors about purchases of um, semiconductors, which in fact the semiconductor industry doesn't want. Um, because it'll force them to shift production to China, which they don't really necessarily want to do. Um, I, I would have said Boeing, but maybe not. Um, and some other kind of big name products. Um, the Chinese have already started to make some practices, promises on IP theft and forced technology transfer. But I, what I'm hearing is that the kind of um, hardcore inside the administration, in, in particular uh, Peter Navarro and uh, Robert uh, Leitzinger, you know, they're not going to see what they want to see, which is concrete promises from the Chinese and metrics and, and then clear sanctions after the Chinese fail to do what they've always promised to do. Right? So the president seems more willing to take a deal that addresses the bilateral trade deficit, but not the larger structural issues um, on the tech side, so the semiconductor one I mentioned, um, you know, the tech companies have been worried about, you know, kind of both the talent issue, um, the export controls, which I mentioned, uh, foreign investment, but also the, what, what's going to happen to the price of components, right? And, and in particular 5G, because, you know, AT&T and Verizon and others, they believe, and they're probably right, that the most of the value to eventually be captured in 5G is going to be in services, right? And what you provide over the top, like it is with the internet. Um, and so to get competitive on that side, you've you got to roll it out. Uh, and so they've been saying, look, if, if we're not sure where the supply chains are, if we're not getting uh, uh, components from China, we're, we're going to be slower than the Europeans uh, and the Chinese in rolling out, and then we're going to be slower in rolling out these new services. Um, is there anything we can do as individuals uh, here in Columbus to, um, you know, does this impact us in a way that's real and tangible and maybe on our phones or, and, and what do we do about it? Uh, so I would, I mean, so the, the vast majority of people, you know, their risk is 
not high that the Chinese state is coming to get them. There's the good news. Yeah, yeah, there's good news. We got it, so. I mean, you have to be worried about basic cybersecurity, right? So, you know, all the usual stuff. Don't reuse your passwords. Use a password manager. Uh, enable two-factor authentication. Um, it's good to have a backup of everything you have uh, not connected to the computer. So in case you get ransomware, it doesn't spread to your backup. So the, all of that stuff, you know, pretty, pretty basic. You know, I'm assuming most of you are not being targeted by, the, by PLA hackers. If, though, you are in a sector where the Chinese um, are interested, and, you know, there is a list. You can go find out, you know, new materials, uh, autonomous vehicles, new energy, then you should think more about what your external and internal threats are. You know, when the Chinese delegation comes to say, you know, we want to do an exchange or we're interested in buying your technology and you send them on their way, it's very likely in that two weeks after, you're going to get a cyber attack. Um, that tends to how it works, right? They, there tends to be a delegation that comes. If you leave them alone, they, you might find out that they've been plugging their USBs into things they shouldn't be plugging them into. And then if you can't come to an agreement, then the, then the attacks might, might start. So, I w and then, uh, you know, at the, at the university, of course, if your lab uh, is in one of these spaces, you should also clearly be, be aware. But for most people, again, uh, you know, my kids also use TikTok. Um, I'm not crazy about where the data is going, um, but that's not a huge concern because, you know, quite honestly, they're also using Snapchat and Instagram, and, you know, I'm not worried, about, I'm more worried about that data. Good point. Uh, last question. Overall, this is, uh, I'm not sure this is in your purview, but uh, this uh, audience member wants, that stop to, me? Wants, wants to know your thoughts. Overall, what do you see uh, the future world with technology looking like? Uh, specifically, <laughs> any live human interaction? <laughs> uh, you mean like a cyborg? I take the answer to mean kind of a cyborg or, well, so on, on the, <coughs> Look, we, with the, the Chinese, you know, scientists just got in trouble six months ago, a year ago, on uh, CRISPR and gene editing, right? And we know that in East Asia in particular, there are not the same both regulations in place and not the same religious uh, prohibitions against, um, you know, uh, em embryology and other types of work that we in the United States would, would not do for ethical and, and religious reasons. So there clearly is kind of... Uh, on that front, uh, stuff that is, I think, a little frightening and, and scary. Um, and a good would be that it would be great to have another discussion with uh, the Chinese on what types of things we think humans should be doing. You know, with this case of the CRISPR editing, the Chinese said, oh, we didn't know about it, right? And, and, we're, and this guy is now under house arrest. It's What's cri well, CRISPR editing? Crisp yeah, yeah you, I, I can only say CRISPR. Um, basically, it's I editing specific genes. Um, yeah, okay, so you, this guy did it, I think, to make them uh, HIV resistant. Uh, but he also um, manipulated some other thing to, it's like to make them, um, to give them some strength. I can't remember what it was. Mm. But basically make, I'm sorry? A female gender. Fe Oh yes, he wanted to, well that, that was happening before, but this with the CRISPR, was it the, the gender thing? I thought it was also HIV resistant and some other thing. But we don't know how it works, right? We don't know what's gonna turn out, and, and so that would be a useful kind of conversation to have. I, if on the cyborg side, like implementing, uh, in, you know, uh, computer chips and other things, um, I don't really know a huge amount about that. I know, you know, certainly uh, it's happening on the medical device side, um, I don't think we're anywhere near kind of a, you know, singularity, wetware, uh, you know, hardware recreates what we have in our brain. Uh, that, I, I got plenty of other things to worry about before we get there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me again in thanking our distinguished speaker. Great. And thank you all for being here. You may have noticed on your seats uh, information about our upcoming International Award Ceremony, where we will be honoring the International Company of the Year, CAS, as well as recognizing the achievements of our high school students. So if you'd like to be there and celebrate with us, please do so. Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned.